Сегодня речь идет об охоте на Красный Октябрь. Это один из моих любимых фильмов. I don't know Russian unless it's with a Scottish accent. Хорошо, прими штурвал. So tonight we're talking about Hunt for Red October, right. and uh, this is one of my favorite all-time films. I, I think you know that. It's probably in my top With good 10. reason, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a film I grew up with, uh, seen so many times, originally saw it on television. Uh, I had recorded it off of TV and probably wore out that, that videotape. I remember very clearly the first time I saw the unedited version, and it was startling to me to, to not see the commercial breaks and some of the, the scenes were actually expanded so it kind of felt like seeing a uh, director's cut or expanded cut of the I film. I think that's something kids today won't ever really appreciate. Yeah. Uh, being introduced to movies by network television, yeah. right? Like we would have been at that time, right? I got it on VHS and widescreen. It was one of the first widescreen VHS tapes I ever got. Uh, of course, DVD and uh, now it's I think you even have it on 4K at this point. Yeah, I got the the Jack Ryan five pack. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's it looks sweet. I just watched it on that in anticipation of our conversation. Loved it. Loved yeah. every frame of it. It looked great. Yeah. So I think this is going to be one of those uh, reviews that we are probably fawning over the film, uh, probably more so than our, our last review of 2001, where it's a bit more, bit more contentious. Yeah. But I think that's okay. Um, it's hard to see this movie as having been 30 years old already. You know, yeah. when I watched it again for this conversation, I was struck by just how relevant it still seems. Yeah. And I think it's partly because they, they play the politics of it so well. They, they situate it clearly in the Cold War. It's kind of this, that little opening scrawl that comes across the screen gives you this sense that you're, you're getting a special uh, sneak peek into this world. Uh, that nobody really technically knows about, right? It was hidden by the, both the Soviet and the American authorities. And that in of itself makes the film all of a sudden feel like, ooh, it got unearthed. And so I think that, yes, some of it's dated because it just is. It's of an era, but it yeah. still feels so very contemporary as you watch it. Uh, so I suppose we should just kind of take it from the top in terms of how the film starts. We have that uh, opening scene aboard the Red October, that very strong close-up of Sean Connery's eyes, where Sean Connery plays Marco Ramius, who's the, uh, the commander of the Red October, right. the uh, Soviet submarine. And it's, it's a beautiful little opening uh, scene that always stands out to me, uh, kind of this solemn moment before the mission starts, before diving. Parade, Captain. Parade. New para. And you can see in his eyes that he's really saying goodbye to, to Russia in that scene once you know the context of, of that scene. And That's one of the things the that, the film. yeah, the film does a good job. It obviously works very much as a first time viewing. You yeah. get the sense of, okay, this is a good movie. It's exciting. It's interesting. There's, a, there's a intrigue into it. But then you also then have this advantage because there's layers to it. And there's actually depth and the characters are, are well realized that when you go back and revisit it, you'll see and pick up on things that were there that you didn't appreciate or interpret a certain way. And the opening scene is a good example of that, you know, in terms of Ramius. I mean, he's, he's clearly the one that's the most complex character because his motives aren't immediately obvious to us. Yeah. Jack Ryan, you get who he is. Uh, you understand what he's trying to accomplish. The general was right. I am not field personnel. I am only an analyst. You're perfect. I can't ask any of these characters to go. One, they don't believe in it. Two, they'd never stake their reputation on a hunch. Whereas you are expendable. 
it's it's I think clearly the Sean Connery uh, one of his more incredible performances in the later part of his career, his post Bond career. We will pass through the American patrols, pass their sonar nets, and lay off their largest city, and listen to their rock and roll while we conduct missile drills. Yeah, he's definitely the main star here, right? Whereas the other Jack Ryan movies really focus on Jack Ryan very heavily. And, and of course, Alec Baldwin uh, is a primary character, but it's Connery on the poster. It's Connery gets top billing. Uh, this is really his movie, ultimately. Mm -hmm. He's so good in it, you really don't even care the fact that he clearly has a Scottish accent. Yeah. The, uh, evidently, he t attempted a Russian accent. I mean, this is supposedly him attempting a Russian accent. Some call it Putin. Coyote. Dubai. He's just terrible at doing... <laughs> I mean, his voice is just so strong, I think yeah. you can't really do anything about it. Thank you, that'll be all, Doctor. As far as his performance, I think it still is a very uh, good performance that sets up uh, the, the central dilemma of this movie. He really brings that that power to the screen, and of course his history just as a, a leading man helps too. But uh, yeah, that little opening is great. Sam Neill is introduced as well. Uh, Borden is his first officer, and his relationship is an interesting one throughout the film too. We can kind of get into that a little bit more later. But it, it really sets up the, the tone of the film well, and of course um, Basil Polidoris' score comes up, that, that wonderful choral theme. That, that main theme of this film, I just assumed must have been some piece of Russian music. It, it's so good yeah. and it's just very memorable yeah. that you just kind of feel like, oh, this is something that Soviet military must have set out to see on and it just feels like it, right? Yeah. After the, the title screen, of course, we are introduced to Jack Ryan and he's on a plane and, you know, this is a real movie, Nate. This is this is something we don't see anymore. Uh, so something is set up in that scene, the fact that he hates turbulence. I can never sleep on a plane. Turbulence. Pardon? Turbulence. Solar radiation heats the Earth's crust. Warm air rises, cool air descends. Turbulence. I, I don't like that. And so the little moment he has uh, watching his coffee cup rattling it informs his character, but it also comes into play later in the film, too. Some turbulence, say, Commander! You don't play flying, huh? Oh, this is nothing! You could have been with us five, six months ago! Boom! Oh, you talk about guilt! That's one of the things I, I really, you know, think it's important to talk about this movie. Why does it work better than a lot of movies do today? Uh, as you said, it's a real movie. You don't see those too often nowadays. And, I mean, they still are making Jack Ryan's shows. Uh, I have not seen the Amazon show. But it just seems like the more recent movies aren't anything like what this was. Because you have clearly good script writing and plot structure. You, as you were saying, you're setting things up, there's going to be payoffs. So, I mean, there's, there's all those little things in just your developing character. But the way it handles exposition in this is fantastic. Because Jack Ryan is somehow managing to be both expert as well as fish out of water. He's our conduit into the story because, you know, we don't really know anything about this world. But he is also a competent authority for us to walk with. You see that ring on his finger? The Academy, class of 72, a Marine. You're kidding. How did you? Greer told me. Summer of his third year, he went down in a chopper accident in the med. Bad. Pilot crew killed. That kid spent 10 months in traction, another year learning to walk again. Now, it's up to you, Charlie, but you might consider cutting the kid a little slack. He's somebody you can root with. You can actually be inspired by him and excited for him uh, as you're going through it. So I think it's just great. And the way they just bring in these briefing scenes and then you learn who the characters are. You learn the stakes of the story. And the stakes are grounded. I mean, it's not like, you know, the world's going to all blow up like they're, you know, okay, we got to stop the special device. Yeah. That, you know, has, but it kind of is that, too, because it could become this. Mr. Ryan, would you characterize this as a first strike weapon? Uh, that is a possibility, sir. It really struck me how you don't really know the true intention of Ramius of the Red October until well into the film. It's really that, that dinner scene where the, um, the plan to defect is actually truly revealed. Before we sailed, I dispatched a letter to Admiral Bedoran, in which I announced our intention to defect. 
they don't know what right. what the intentions are exactly. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's it's just to me, it's it's grounded and it's there's there's actual weight to the drama that unfolds, whereas a lot of movies now don't have that. Yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned the briefing scene, and that's that's a very important scene that really I think reveals Jack Ryan's character in in a very specific way. Like you said, I think Alec Baldwin. I think his performance is excellent here. Uh, there's been many reincarnations of um, of the Jack Ryan character. Mm -hmm. Here, he really, as you said, he strikes that balance between being knowledgeable but also being vulnerable and being uh, uncomfortable with the situation. How do you do, Captain? It's a pleasure to be aboard. Back to the the briefing scene. That scene contains my favorite description of politicians of all time. <laughs> I'm a politician, which means I'm a cheat and a liar. And when I'm not kissing babies, I'm stealing their lollipops. There isn't this sense of, well, let's do some sort of, you know, advertising of politics. It's really an apolitical film, mm -hmm. if, you're, if we're thinking about it, yet it's dealing with political matters. But ultimately, you get the sense nobody wants the world to blow up. Yeah, exactly. And that's the theme that really, I think, ultimately emerges in this movie. It's it's really about trying to avert catastrophe, and that winds up, as we get through the story, becoming what we understand Ramius's intention of defecting. Yeah, and of course, the death of his wife uh, while he was at sea is, is a big motivator for him, too, I think. Um, but we should talk about... Like real people, these characters have multiple dimensions to them yeah. that make them fascinating to watch and rewatch. <laughs> it's amazing. It's an amazing thing. The the big uh, secret of the Red October is the fact that it has this silent caterpillar drive, right? So uh, this drive that makes it pretty much invisible to sonar. And that's what makes it just such a, a horrible and dangerous threat. And at this point, we're introduced to the crew of the USS Dallas, commanded by Bart Mancuso, played by Scott Glenn. Now, if that bastard so much as twitches, I'm going to blow him right to Mars. Another fantastic performance in this movie that I think it's overlooked. He just evokes that seasoned authority perfectly, but in a very different way than Ramius. It's, it's interesting, especially when we get the two of them together toward the end of the movie, and we kind of see how, yeah. how they're similar, yet how they clash. You're picking up on the fact that there's an American atmosphere and a Russian atmosphere, yeah. right? They're, they're not identical. And that's evoked in the production design too. The American subs look very lived in and kind of used and not as sleek, whereas the Red October's has a very almost sexy appearance to it, right? It, it's just very Which gives sexy. also the sense that it's the more dangerous thing. And the more it's, advanced it's new, sub, it's, yeah. This is the, the targeted thing. A lot more chrome, it's shinier. Uh, the uniforms, of course, are much more formal. And it just seems like, almost like a spaceship. We're introduced to the character of Jones, or Jonesy, who's the sonar man. Another very strong performance, too. He is so skilled, he's able to actually hear the Red October and its silent drive. An early performance, by the way, of Courtney E. Vance, who's yep. become pretty accomplished and what recognized now after many, many years of working, but he's very good as, as Jonesy. Yeah, great source of comedy in the film, too. So he gets this piece of Pavarotti. It was Paganini. What happened? It was Paganini. L this is my story. Okay. Tell it right, cop. Pavarotti is a tenor. Paganini was a composer. It's a, it's a great film that's fascinating in that it doesn't have the classic clear-cut villain, uh, but it still has an incredible propulsion. Yeah, the villain is almost the, the idea the of misinterpretation. Of, yeah. The threat of war. <laughs> yeah, the threat of war, it's much more existential, right? It's uh, not assigned to any one person. Skarsgård uh, as Tupolev, like you said, you could identify him as, well, he's maybe something a little more tangible in terms of an enemy. But if anything, he's almost a, a source of competition for Ramius. Mm -hmm because Ramius taught his character um, pretty much everything he knows, and that tension plays into it as well. After this point, we're just treated to some tremendously effective uh, suspense sequences. Uh, when the Red October goes through uh, Red Route 1, through the, the underwater canyons, we get to see Ramius' skills at work, right, right. And, and his mastery as a, as a submarine commander. Which is getting back at the whole point. When the final climax does happen, 
we're not shocked by the fact that they can do things, that he's figuring things out, that you know, you're, you're not sure exactly how it's all going to play out in that climactic submarine battle. But you understand that, okay, I can believe that these things he's doing are going to make sense, that he's, yeah. he's making some, because I've already seen him establish that he has competence in these areas well before then. Yeah, and we're shown at several points throughout the film that he has real pride in his boat, in his men. Even though he is defecting, it's a bittersweet thing for him. That tremendous singing sequence always stands out. I love Connery's performance during that scene because he he says, let them sing, right? Mm -hmm. And there's really this moment of pride that he does have that seems genuine. And it's not a cynical thing, like you said. He he is proud of his accomplishments and proud of proud of his men and what what uh, what they do symbolize insofar as maintaining honor and loyalty and some of the good things that may come out of uh, a dark system like communism. I think part of it's to give credit here to obviously the great screenplay, but also to John McTiernan and his directing. Yeah. This was coming out at the time where he was really the hot action director, right? Yeah. Uh, he had already made at this point Predator and Die Hard that had established him in the late 80s. And then coming right now into the early 90s, he kept going on. Fortunately, his career petered out pretty fast after this. But I mean, he just really is able to balance so much. You think about how much this movie moves, uh, but it doesn't feel chaotic. I'm just thinking about this compared to, let's look at a movie that came out last year, uh, The Rise of Skywalker, where it's moving from planet to planet to planet. And I just remember sitting there like, I'm going to throw up because <laughs> it just, it's, it's moving, but it's incoherent. Yeah. This thing changes locations a lot. But it establishes clear places like hubs that you're kind of coming back to that you get grounded in. You know, so you have the Red October is one hub. The Dallas is one hub. And Jack's moving around trying to get to it. And you're like, okay, somehow these things are going to collide. Uh, but you're moving pretty fast among all these things, yeah. which creates that sense of urgency. Uh, beautifully, beautifully edited film, I guess. You know, really. I mean, McTiernan and... I can't remember who the editors are. It's a team of them on this one. But uh, it just they do such a great job of really balancing so many threads and plot lines that you know are going to come together. You don't exactly know how they're going to come together, but you're excited to see. And like you said, isn't that what movies are supposed to be? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and just the visuals, too. I mean, this is one of my favorite films just in terms of cinematography. Jan de Bont, uh, one Bont. of his works. Yep, and he of course went on to direct Speed and Twister, and and his style is very apparent here. Just the lens choices, the the anamorphic, the use of the the widescreen is very effective here. And I just remember being so struck at the photography the first time I really saw it in widescreen, and how characters are placed in the frame. Visually, it's just beautiful. And of course, ILM does some incredible model work with the submarines. That's one. Uh, one thing you kind of have to overlook in terms of accuracy with this, with this film, submarines, of course, that deep would be in complete darkness. But that would well, but work. you can't show it then. So yeah, I mean, you just realize exactly. that's a, that's a necessary evil for making a movie, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. No fear impact. Twelve seconds. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Navigator. I've seen a lot of modern submarine films that use CGI and they just don't look as good as this. Yeah, I was thinking about the other movie to, to naturally compare this to, which is not that long before, it is Das Boat, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah. Which is a very different submarine movie, yeah. but you know, clearly also very much grounded in the re realism of, of a U-boat, right? And I was thinking about the cinematography because you brought up Jan de Bont's work and the, the, the way this is versus that film. Uh, how that movie uses its cinematography to really throw you into the mess of it all. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just feel dirty kind of, and sweaty and just kind of, ugh, and when yeah. you're watching Das Boat. This feels so very polished, and I think part of it's because of the choice of using a scope aspect ratio. 
uh, it feels like a big movie and it feels like something really epic and exciting. And if you had done that, you know, one eight five ratio, I don't know that it works as well for what they're trying to accomplish here. Uh, you would think that claustrophobic setting that a scope ratio wouldn't work, but it does. And it, it also provides that sense of grandness in the final scenes when you're seeing the subs moving through, which yes, like you said, you shouldn't be able to see them, but you kind of need to have that sense of grandeur in this movie and it, it, it balances it perfectly. Yeah. Well, yeah, as the film progresses, it gets more personal in many ways. So another scene that stands out to me is that exchange between Ramius and Borden, so um, Sam Neill's character, and they have that conversation about what they would hope to do when they get to America. Two wives and eating rabbits, right? Yeah. <laughs> well then, in winter I will live in Arizona. Actually, I think I will need two wives. Oh, at least. <laughs> it's, it's a great moment. You just really get the sense again that these two men have a tremendous history and, and, and an affection for each other just uh, in terms of just how, how close they are as friends and, and that uh, comes through beautifully. But it's also a great little encapsulation of the nature of the Cold War itself. A war with no battles, no monuments, only casualties. Yeah, you know, we talk about perfect movies. We talked about 2001 last time. A lot of people think that's a perfect movie. This is perfect for what it is. This is perfect for what right. it is. I, I would put this on the list of, of perfect movies, or as perfect as it can get. The final, I, I, there's one little, it's, it's as nitpicky as you can get in these kinds of things, but the very ending when they're talking on the Red October, yeah. those shots, yeah. they're not good. <laughs> I was going to mention that. There's two things that don't quite make it perfect. I guess if you're going to nitpick, that's one of them. Those process shots are pretty rough. Ooh, I mean, it's like, it looks like they're moving 100 miles per hour <laughs> down that river with just the lightest breeze in their hair. Well, it's just, the focal length isn't right either, right? Yeah. There are these close-up shots and the background shouldn't be like in this sharp focus, but but they wanted this moonlight sort of look to mm -hmm. it. And and that's the way they accomplished it. It is kind of a shame they didn't just go out and shoot that for real on a location somewhere. Right. But the performances are great in that little bit. And it's a nice... Which makes it all the more upsetting because <laughs> they, this is like you, you learn Ramius's point, you, you, all this stuff, and then I'm looking at it like, you yeah. guys didn't get the shots. <laughs> the, Nitpick, I know, but yeah, it's still... Well, the other imperfection is back on the Dallas. Console on Crazy Ivan. When Jack Ryan makes the prediction of which direction the red October is going to turn when it pulls a Crazy Ivan. Mancuso asks what direction, talking to the sonar man. Which way is he turning, Jones? To the starboard, sir. But his voice is not edited to sound like it's coming over the intercom. I don't know if you ever noticed that. Console on Crazy Ivan. To the starboard, sir. And it's always a, a, a weird thing to me that that didn't get fixed. And it's never been fixed in any of the video releases either. Uh, but those are the only two flaws I can find in this movie. Right. Well, I'm sure there's other continuity errors or something like that, yeah. too. But yeah. no, I, again, like the... The Scottish accent by Connery, I mean, you could, I guess, say, well, hey, wait a second. But you just go with it, right? You accept it for what it is. Yeah. And, but no, I mean, it is, as far as this kind of movie, this, I'm hard-pressed to think of a better, I don't know if it is, is it a thriller, espionage, action. It's kind of all those things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can't really think of too many movies that even get close to this. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think about movies that I'd want to show it a new generation of people to introduce them to films. Yeah. This is one that I'd want them to see. Yeah. You know, this is this is the movie I'd want to show someone say, here's how movies can be. And this is what we should be expecting of our movies. Aircraft on computer guidance, request permission to launch the weapon. You are authorized to launch the weapon. The weapon is away. 